compound interest can be a double-edged sword, a powerful force in the world of finance that can work for you as an investor or against you as a borrower. For investors, it's the magic that can turn modest savings into a mountain of wealth. Interest is not just earned on your initial investment, but also on the accumulated interest over time, leading to exponential growth. For borrowers, though, the same principle can be a pitfall. Here, interest is not just charged on the principal amount, but also on the accumulated interest, causing debt to balloon rapidly if not managed wisely. The strategy for investors is clear. Start early, invest consistently, and let time magnify the growth of your investments. For borrowers, the key lies in understanding loan terms, prioritizing the payment of high interest debts, and avoiding unnecessary borrowing to keep the compounding effect in check. So in this last segment, we're talking about that compound interest can actually work against you. So it depends how you're using compound interest. Are you an investor or are you a debtor? Doc G, many doctors, MDs, have significant student loan debt after medical school. In your experience, do they understand? Can they balance the difference between the good debt, the bad debt, and the investing? Well, thankfully, when you come out of medical school, you also have a high income. So you have a high shovel to dig yourself or a a big shovel to dig yourself out of this debt. So, you know, it runs the gamut. And there are now services that help you look at your student loans. And so you can figure out what the best way to pay them off and how quickly you need to do it. Um, So I don't think it's as bleak with some of the professionals like physicians as you would think. I guess what the more bleak portion is it keeps people in medicine who don't want to do it anymore. So there are a lot of people who get burned out in medicine. They don't like their jobs and the debt is the reason they stay in. But the grand majority of physicians find a way to pay off their debt, but it's something they may carry for sometimes years, sometimes decades, depending on who the person is and how quickly they want to pay it off. And as you were saying, the negative compounding can cost them million dollars in millions of dollars in aggregate over time, but it also slows them down from that positive compounding. So it's that doubly edged negative sword that's really hurting them on both sides. Helene, you addressed debt in the index card, like armed with the knowledge of compound interest, how should people prioritize paying off their debt? Um, This is a really good question um, because there's two competing theories, as I'm sure you know, which is the first is, you know, it's best known by the Dave Ramsey term, the snowball method, which is, is you prioritize paying down your smallest debt first and do it smallest to largest. And the idea is, is this will keep you on the, the, the you know, the true path and the, you will ultimately pay down your, your debt, um, which is good in theory and does seem to have some evidence on its side, though people have only really looked at it in like one or two year periods, not over a longer term. Um, longer term, over the longer term. But, you know, the other issue is, of course, the interest rate. And that doesn't really work if, say, your smallest debt is, say, your student loan, which probably has a much lower interest rate than your credit card. Um, Your student loan, it probably at most is at 8%. And that's probably, you know, and then your credit card is almost certainly over, unless you have a zero interest temporary promotional, uh, is probably over 20%. And so, you know, I'm always arguing with people to try to pay, to find like a like um, a buddy, you know, that you could like an accountability buddy that you could work with, and to go for the larger debt, because I do think that ultimately paying down the money is, the, you know, the debt. I mean, I'm sorry, is the most valuable thing you can do. Um, I do want to say one thing that Harold and I really have found, or both of us have found over the years is the number of people who, you know, will build up fairly substantial emergency funds while still maintaining a not insignificant amount of credit card debt is really shocking. And, you know, the part of the theory seems to be is that they don't want to build up more debt. But on the other hand, at a certain point, it's a very counterproductive strategy. Uh, As I said, this debt is usually growing at fairly significant rates. It is negative compounding. And the quicker you can pay off a car load, a 
credit card, you know, anything vaguely high interest. I mean, any debt at all, you know, truthfully, but certainly, you know, the higher interest. Um, mortgage debt is, I always think, a slightly different issue because like right now, there are huge numbers of people um, sitting on mortgages of 3% or under. And, and our, a good argument could be made for not paying those off entirely for a very long time to come. <laughs> for sure. It can be invested better over a longer period. Yeah, exactly. I mean, basically they're paying you to, for, you know, for, you know, to, to, to stay in the house at a certain point. So. Mariko, do you still put on your analyst hat? Like do higher interest rates today, any concern about companies that have a lot of debt on their balance sheet or like the, the amount of leverage in some of the commercial real estate market? Yeah, I think, you know, having, grown up in the 70s right so i um i i know what the you know what what life was like before the the 30 year decline in interest rates and i think you know um money just got so cheap and your return hurdle so low and and i think there there is a reckoning coming. I mean, everyone likes to kick the can down and, you know, lenders don't also want to like have to have to take a hit. So, you know, it doesn't all happen all at once, but there's an awful lot of commercial real estate debt that is going to be coming due in the next three years. Uh, and uh, where the rent rolls didn't make much sense, even at lower interest rates, uh, they are definitely going to be underwater. And so, uh, you know, the, 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 so yes, and the other thing is equity investors tend not to be really great credit analysts. So I always look to the bond, the credit guys who are just much more sensitive, the canary in the coal mine around, around credit. And for the longest time, you didn't need to have credit chops because you know it was a rising tide. And I think now like it really pays to pay attention to that. The other thing too, is that with higher rates, you know, um, people are going to start paying attention to float a lot more and trying to hang on to float, which means that they're going to not want to, you know, pass on the money to you or take your money sooner. And so that's another kind of habit from the seventies that kind of went away uh, where people didn't have to sort of monitor their, their, the, the cost of financing your customers. Right? It got was cheap and immaterial. Now it's starting to be material. Because you're lending them money effectively for every dollar that they owe you that they haven't paid you, you're lending them money at five percent. So that's money that you you know. So so I feel like there's some changes in the cash management of small businesses in their cash management cycle that they need to pay attention to, as well, um, too. Yeah, we've seen some just changes. Like a back in the day, it was like. 15 years ago, I was looking for companies that had very little debt on their balance sheet. But then when you have 0% interest rates and money so cheap, it's very hard to find companies today that don't have debt on their balance sheet. They've all borrowed. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah they and all then maybe borrow. the pendulum yeah. swings now. Yeah. They all borrowed because it was cheap and how could you not? Right. And, um, and I do feel like if you have, and I, I've seen individuals with that mindset too. But the thing is, if you don't have a plan for it, right? you know, borrowing money when you don't have a plan, even if the interest rate is low, is not a great idea. I think, you know, if you, you need to be intentional about your debt. And it's, you know, leverage is a beautiful, properly deployed, a really beautiful thing. Um, but it needs to be properly deployed. And uh, I think for a lot of people, it just was so cheap, it just didn't matter. And now it's, suddenly starting to matter a lot. Doc G or Helene, any final thought? Compounding is good. Keep on using it. Put your money away. Invest it simply and easily and don't touch it. Yeah, I, I always say save, put money in a low cost index fund. Don't think about it potentially for decades. Yeah, yeah mattress money. Uh, the other thing I would add is on the debt piece. If you can also see what's the compounding in your, in your debt, then I think it, because you think, oh, I just, you know, 
I don't know, I have $500 in my credit card, but you're not actually seeing that that $500 is turning into $750, you know, oh, oh, I don't know, in about two and a half months or something, right? I mean, so I think that's the other thing is when you actually see that, I think that 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 seeing it can be a, a, a reality call, you know, a wake up call mm -hmm. as well. So I think the power of compounding, let's bring those million dollar returns forward Right. And then let's also look at the pushing out of the, the debt forward. And um, hopefully that that brings um, better, better habits um, to, to do that. Get scared and long on your investments. Yeah, We covered a lot today. We had great stories. I'll just do three quick takeaways. Number one, the power of patience and time in wealth accumulation. The transformative nature of compound interest has been called the eighth wonder of the world. So the key takeaway here is that allowing your investments to grow over time through the magic of compounding can turn even a modest savings into something more substantial. And then patience becomes a crucial element in the journey toward financial security and prosperity. Number two, diverse investment vehicles can utilize compound interest. So compound interest applies to a variety of investments from stocks to bonds, to retirement accounts like IRAs and 401ks to taxable accounts. Each vehicle plays a unique role in harnessing the power of compound interest, guiding individuals toward financial freedom and security. And then finally, timing matters. Start early for greater wealth. The earlier you start, the greater the compound growth. And the key takeaway here is the importance of patience and long-term planning as even minimal consistent investments made early in life over decades can transform into a significant nest egg. So I wanna thank our panelists today. Please follow them. You can find Helene Olin at helenolin.com. Jordan Dockji Grummet is at earnandinvest.com. And Mariko Gordon, you can find her at marikogordon.com. And Michael Gayed, who had to leave us early, you can find him on Twitter where he has something like 750,000 followers, but you can find him at Lead Lag Report. So thank you everyone for listening and watching this episode about compound investing. Next week, we have episode 16, Investing in Your Health, the Intersection of Wellness and Wealth. I think that one of the panelists will be Mike Taylor, who is a hedge fund manager and portfolio manager of the Pink ETF that donates its net profits in the form of its annual management fee to the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation. He's gonna be a panelist. And as Mike says, the hardest part about wealth is lasting to enjoy it. So please join us Wednesday, that's December 6th at 6 p.m. Eastern. Until next time, do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens. And don't forget to invest early and often.